going to uh, take up our offering in our gifts, and so I'm going to ask the ushers, if you would, go ahead and uh, move into place. And as they move into place, let me just say uh, thank you to all of you uh, who take that step of supporting this church and what it's about and what it's uh, doing. So as we do this, uh, let me say a prayer. Would you bow your heads with me? Father, we come before you, and we just thank you for this time to just come and worship you, to focus on you. We pray that this would be a morning that you just unite us, that wherever we are in our spiritual journey, that we would in some way get to taste or experience just who you are here this morning in a meaningful uh, way, Father. We pray all of this in your son's name. Amen. Amen. Uh, well, this morning, uh, we start a new series uh, called Remember, Discover, Celebrate. Remember, Discover, Celebrate. Uh, and just to help you remember that, let's say those three words together, okay? Say these with me, remember? Remember, discover, celebrate. Now, the reason that's so important, the reason we've named the series that is because these three elements were an important part of a series of feasts that were practiced in the Old Testament. And these feasts were practiced uh, every single year. And the reason they did this was because through practicing these feasts, it would focus on remember, discover, celebrate. It would unite them. It would unite them as a community. And more than just a community with one another, it had a way of uniting them as a community and being united with God. And that is such a beautiful thing when a community comes together as united but they're also united in something more than just themselves, but with God. And it's this beautiful thing. It had a way of lifting them up out of just being religious in what they would do. But it lifted them up into relationship. And relationship is where we experience the beauty and the wonder of just who God is and who he's created us to be. And this value of being lifted up in community uh, you know, from something more than just religion and, and relationship, of course, is something we uh, value in a huge way around here. And one of the great ways you can experience that in a very practical way around here is through what we call our ABS, or our Adult Bible Fellowships. And, and you may ask, well, what is an Adult Bible Fellowship? Um, it's really, it's just a community. It's people being united together, uh, sometimes with interest, sometimes just coming together where you can know and be known, where you can love and be loved. And our ABFs meet every single Sunday, and it's a chance to just build those relationships. And you'll recall, a few weeks ago, I made this challenge that looking in a room like this size right here, knowing uh, that probably close to 500 of us here in this room don't have that kind of community. And the challenge that I gave is that if you're part of those 500, make this year a year where you step into community, where you go to explore and figure out how do I get into that kind of community? Because it really will make a difference in your life. Well, today is a great day for you to begin exploring our Adult Bible Fellowships, a place where you can begin building authentic, genuine relationships. We have another component to our Adult Bible Fellowships, and that is teaching the Bible. Teaching the Bible in a really genuine way that lifts us up out of what's just religion into what's really relational and what's really practical. So today, we are having a little bit of a celebration uh, with all of our Adult Bible Fellowships. In fact, when you walked in, you may have seen uh, all the camping gear that was out there and all the stuff that was out there. That is a part of just celebrating our ABFs and some of the stuff they do. And so today we're having this celebration that is all about our Adult Bible Fellowships. If you want to explore maybe getting in one, go out to the plaza area, talk to some of our leaders and some of the people in our Adult Bible Fellowships, learn about what they're like and what you may discover is there's an adult Bible fellowship that would be a great fit for you, that you would love to be a part of, that you would get a lot out of. So go discover what that is. Now, one other adult Bible fellowship that we're going to be launching here uh, in two weeks is centered on building a community for single parents. And, you know, it's single parents that maybe get isolated faster and easier than uh, any other segment in our culture today because there's so much that you're doing trying to raise kids that you're doing it by yourself. Wouldn't it be awesome if you could have an adult Bible fellowship where you could find fellowship, where you could know and be known, where you could find support, love, but also people that just kind of understand where you are. 
That's what this Adult Bible Fellowship is all about. We're going to be launching that in two weeks. And so just pay attention as we're going to talk more about how to get involved in that. In fact, if you want, you can go out there uh, if you're interested and ask them just what that's all about. So take that step. If you don't have that kind of community, take that step uh, here today. Well, Ryan's getting ready to start us off. Uh, on this series that is all about these feasts where we're going to learn about what it means to remember, discover, and celebrate. Mexico, standing out looking out at the ocean, and he sees a whale pass by way off in the distance, and so he jumped in a kayak and paddled out six miles to go be a part of this thing, and suddenly realized he was too close and just how small he really is. <laughs> he also realized how tired he was having to paddle six miles back. And we'd all look at each other and we'd smile, knowing that story could have gone a lot worse, you know, and then that happened. At some point in time, my sister would probably chime in, and she would probably try to convince you of the fact that it was really rough in her upbringing having to grow up with a brother like me. <laughs> She'd probably tell you a story about how when we were younger, I used to put a sleeping bag over her body and leave her blindly around the house, and how most of the time when this would occur, I'd lead her up to the top of the stairwell and tell her it was a bedroom, and push her. And then she'd go end over end in the sleeping bag, sometimes so fast that she'd actually clear all the way around the landing and make it down the stairs in the tile below. We had a lot of fun growing up. <laughs> we did. We did. At least I did. Uh, but from there, we'd talk about vacations. We'd talk about growing up in our old neighborhood and what that was like. You'd hear moments of great significance, both good and bad, that have come to shape us and the people we now are. And there's something weird, though, and it's this. All those stories have been shared again and again and again. We've all heard them. We all know exactly what's going to be said next. We all roll our eyes at exactly the same moments. We all, I mean, it's all been said before. And yet when we get together, we continue to tell them over and over and over again. And you have to ask the question, why? I mean, do we just not have another conversation? Are we just wasting our breath? Why? But here's the thing, when we all gather together, in fact, when any group of people who have shared a past collective experience, who have commonality within their stories, gather together and they, they reminisce, they tell one another about where they've been, about this story, it does something amazingly powerful. It, it unifies them. It solidifies them as a people. That's what it does with my family. I imagine that's what it does with yours. We remember where we've been. We remember the things that have shaped us. We remember all the, all the things that have made us into the people that we now are. We remember our stories and how they intermingle. We also come to discover, or perhaps rediscover, who we are. We discover the fact that, you know what, right now is not an isolated moment. That our stories are intertwined with the stories of others. That all of these things that have occurred have shaped us into exactly who I now am. We rediscover, perhaps discover, who we are. And in the end, we find ourselves laughing. We smile. We celebrate. All that God's done, all that we are, it's where we're at, it's, it's really this amazing thing. It's powerful and it's unifying. Ancient cultures understood the art of storytelling and celebration before one another. They did. It was a very, very important part of culture. In fact, it was how culture was passed down. It was how beliefs, values, systems, truths, all of these cultural things were passed down from generation to generation. It was often a part of their calendar. Israel was no exception. In fact, God, at one point in time, goes and commands of Israel that they're to celebrate these three different festivals, or as the Bible often refers them, feasts throughout the year. 
And during these feasts, they're to come together and they're to tell the story of all that God's done, of where they've been and how all this has played out. And they're to re remember and reflect upon just who they now are and remember and then celebrate all that God is and all that they are as they move forward. They would do this on a regular basis. It was very powerful. And in the end, as they would come together, they, they left not as a group of, of individuals, not as individual stories or people with different circumstances and situations, although that was still true. Rather, this, they left as a people. It made them a nation. They were Israel. And so as a church, because we in fact, even in this place, we are a people who have gathered together. We have a common shared past experience. We are united in this place because of our story in Jesus Christ. What we're going to do as a church over the next couple weeks in this series, Remember, Discover, and Celebrate, is reflect on one of these three Jewish feasts, one each week, all in hopes that, one, we might you know, kind of understand what they are and, and how they came to be. Two, that we might grasp some of the significance that, that it possessed for the Jewish people and why God did that. But ultimately, number three, and here's the big reason for us, it's that we would come to realize that in Christ, we still have so much to remember, so much to discover about ourselves, and so much to celebrate even today. And so let's not lose this ancient, powerful practice. And let's participate that it might unify us as the church. So today we're going to start with the very first of those feasts that God commands, that God decrees uh, in the book of the law, or the first five books of the Bible. And it's this, the Feast of Unleavened Bread. It's the Feast of Unleavened Bread, or rather bread that has not risen. That's what leaven uh, makes bread rise. And this is a really amazing feast because it is all about declaring a God who moves us from affliction towards freedom. It's all about declaring a God who sets the captives free, who changes everything. So if you have your Bibles, you can turn to Exodus chapter 12 and uh, hang out there for just a moment because I want to make sure we're all on the same page. You see, when the book of Exodus starts, uh, a, a lot has happened. The, God has revealed himself to a people group, uh, the Jewish people, the children of Abraham. And they're just a small nomadic family tribe. And life gets a little rough because there's a famine in the land. And so they, they end up fleeing. They end up seeking refuge in Egypt. And Egypt takes really good care of them. Storehouses of grain. Things work out well. They prosper. This small nomadic tribe grows to be a, a, a nation, really, of almost a million people within the larger nation of Egypt. And Pharaoh gets a little insecure about this. He starts to freak out because a group that size, should they desire, desire to revolt, should they rebel, could actually cause some serious damage. They might actually win. And so, out of that fear, he enslaves them. He, he turns them instantaneously into the workforce, the labor force of Egypt. And so suddenly this nation, this now nation of almost one million Hebrew people become slaves. And nobody wants to be a slave. He's real happy about the life of slavery, and so they push on it. But the harder they push on it, the harder they try to rebel against it or seek their own freedom, the more they clamp down on them, the more they become enslaved, and life gets harder and harder. In fact, towards the end of this, uh, as time has progressed on, they have been given tasks that are virtually impossible to perform throughout the day, and it's all to ingrain this one idea within their collective consciousness, and it's this, you are a slave. You will never be free. <coughs> this is the life that they live. This is where they're at. Well, God raises up a man named Moses at this time to go and set the people free. God wants to do this through him. He goes to Pharaoh, but of course, Pharaoh's not willing to let his workforce go. But there's all kinds of problems. And so he says, no, but God is serious. And God decides to demonstrate his power through all of this. And so he begins to perform through Moses these large-scale miracles. And everything's kind of mounting. Everything's coming to a head until finally there is this climactic moment where God tells Moses to go to the people and tell them, tonight I want you to sacrifice a young lamb. It is people, I want you to do this. And I want you to take the blood of that lamb and smear it upon the doorposts of your house. And that night, great calamity fell upon all of Egypt and the firstborn children died. Except for those who had smeared the blood of the lamb on their doorposts, they are spared. Egypt falls into this great state of wailing, this great state of mourning, everything's in chaos and turmoil. And Pharaoh admits all of his final words of the people and says, just go. In fact, the nation wants them out. Just go, take your people and leave. That's where we find ourselves, Exodus chapter 12, verse 33. The Egyptians were urgent with the people to send them out of the land in haste. For they said, we shall all be dead. The land will be destroyed. 
So the people took their dough before it was leavened, before it had risen, their kneading bowls being bound up in their cloaks on their shoulders. So the people are set free. They don't even have time to pack their meals. They don't even have time to make, you know, legitimate bread, so to speak, leavened bread. And they say they don't have time to wait for it to rise. You've heard the expression sitting around waiting for the bread to rise. You know, they don't have that kind of time. And here's the other thing. When you were set free, I should imagine that moment. When you have been oppressed, when you have been living as a slave, and suddenly you are told, just go and be free, you don't stand around waiting. You don't suddenly ponder, oh, I wonder what I should pack, I wonder what I should bring. You go. And you look at the dough that you've made, the bowl that it is, and you say, well, if that's all I got, that's all I got. And you put it upon your shoulder and your cloak, just like they did, and you march out of Egypt for the first time as freed men and women. It's a powerful moment. And we go down to verse 39. They've left, and now it says, And they baked unleavened cakes of the dove that they had brought out of Egypt. For it was not leavened, because they were thrust out of Egypt, and could not wait, nor had they prepared any provisions for themselves. And so they march out as freed men and freed women, with nothing but the possessions they have, and the food is just the dough on their backs, apparently. Uh, and they finally get to a spot where they're like, you know what, this isn't going to rise, and we're not going to have normal bread, this is all we have, and they bake unleavened cakes. And for the first time, as freed men and women, this is what they eat. This is what they have. And so now that we know all of this, you're ready to hear about the Feast of Unleavened Bread, chapter 13, beginning in verse 3. Then Moses said to the people, Remember this day in which you came out from Egypt, out of the house of slavery, for by a strong hand the Lord brought you out from this place. No leavened bread shall be eaten. Today in the month of Abib, you are going out. And when the Lord brings you into the land of the Canaanites, the Hittites, the Amorites, the Hivites, and the Jebusites, which he swore to your fathers to give you, a land flowing with milk and honey, a land we know of today is Israel. Seven days you shall eat unleavened bread, and on the seventh day there shall be a feast of the Lord. Unleavened bread shall be eaten for seven days. No leavened bread shall be seen with you, and no leaven shall be seen with you in all your territory. And you shall tell your son on that day, it is because of what the Lord did for me when I came out of Egypt. And it shall be to you as a sign on your hand, and as a memorial between your eyes, that the law of the Lord may be in your mouth. For with a strong hand, the Lord has brought you out of Egypt. You shall therefore keep this statute at its appointed time from year to year. This is the feast of the Lord. They finally make it out of Egypt. They are set free. They bake the, the, the dough that was upon their backs into these unleavened cakes. And Moses says, all right, God has decreed. We need to remember this moment. We need to take a mental note of this. And we need to come back to this and celebrate year after year. This is a moment of significance. Something amazing has happened here. And this is how we're going to celebrate this. Every year, we will celebrate the feast, the festival of unleavened bread. And here's basically what it looked like. There's roughly four passages in the Old Testament that, that highlight what would be done. I've just read you one. There's a few more. But let me give you the short and sweet of it. During the months, uh, sometime between March and April, this feast was celebrated every year. It was during the very first harvest of the crop that would come. Uh, and they were instructed to remove all the leaven from among them. To get rid of all of the leaven. Because remember, when we were set free out of Israel, when we were set free out of Egypt, when we were set free from slavery, we had no time to grab hold of leaven. We had none. We left with the unleavened dough upon our backs. Remove the leaven from among you. And then you were to gather or raise a, a young lamb and you were to sacrifice that and, and cook a meal with it. And you and, and the nation, really all together, you guys are going to gather together, whether as families, let's say, like they did in the future, or all together as one, like they did then, uh, and, and celebrate by having this feast together. You're going to consume this Passover lamb, and it will remind you of the lamb that was sacrificed that protected you, that opened the door for you by God and his power to leave Egypt and the time of slavery. And this today is still practiced, by the way. It's called the Passover and it's called a Seder dinner. This is still happening with the Orthodoxy. And every year, people gather together and they consume a Seder. And as you journey through this meal, whether eating or listening, the story of slavery to freedom and all that God did is told over the course of the meal. And everything you eat is deeply symbolic. We had a Passover experience here at the church this last year. Some of you were able to kind of be a part of some of this. In fact, at, some, at one point, you will actually eat salt water amidst this feast and, and watch it drip. It's to remind you of the tears of people in slavery. At one point you will consume bitter herbs, say like you often consume horseradish, something to make you pucker and make your eyes water. And it will remind you of the bitterness of slavery. 
Each thing that you ate, each thing that you drank was symbolic. It helped you to experience all that had happened as you remembered where you had been and all that God had done. And after the meal was consumed, again, for the next seven days, you were eating bread with no leaven. You could eat other things, but if you were to have bread, it must not have to be bread with leaven. By the way, yeast is what makes bread rise. It's leaven. And so basically, yeast in all its various forms wasn't used. Well, we eat unleavened bread today in its various forms. Some of us know it as pita, pita bread. Some of us know it as cracker. In Tucson, the most common unleavened bread there is, is the tortilla. You know, we eat, we eat lots of unleavened bread around here these days. Uh, and, and that's what this was. You were only to eat unleavened bread for the next seven days should you choose to consume bread. And in the very end, you all gathered together for an assembly. So a solemn assembly to reflect on worship. And that's what this feast was. They would do this once every year. Why? Again, so they could remember where they'd been. Because they were slaves. And that was a key moment. That was a key thing. It shaped them. They experienced the hardness of things. They experienced frustration and being beat down. They experienced seeing themselves as less than. They remembered all of this. But they also remembered how God set them free. And his power. And the power of the blood of the Lamb in this. And in doing so, they came to discover who they are. They're free men and women. They're not slaves, but free. They're children of Israel. They're the people of God. This solidified them. And so they would celebrate this truth all together with one another. Deeply powerful and impactful. So what does that mean for us today? If we were to remember, you know, there's parts of the story that we have to remember too. There's, there's things in this too. But we also have this ability through the Passover uh, celebration, through the Feast of Unleavened Bread, to discover something deeply amazing about Jesus. Here's what many of us, I'd argue, in this room probably aren't aware of. At one point in time, Jesus, at the very end of his life, takes his disciples into an upper room for what we've often heard to as the Last Supper. If you haven't heard of it, you've probably seen a painting. Do you realize that was to celebrate the Feast of Unleavened Bread? That what was happening there, it was the Feast of Unleavened Bread. And when they go up into that upper room, it is the Passover night. It is the night of the Passover meal. And what's set at the Last Supper is a Passover feast. And that is the place where Jesus introduces us within Christianity into communion. He reinterprets uh, an act, a, a symbolic part of the Seder dinner, and, and makes it about himself. It's this amazing moment. And so... Friends, church, the Feast of Unleavened Bread is deeply important and relevant for us who are in this place today. Because in a way, we still celebrate it week after week, month after month, year after year. And we take communion. And so there's something deeply significant. So let's spend the remainder of our time. I want to point to two things that, that they discovered about themselves and hopefully we can discover about ourselves uh, that, that show us this great significance of all that Jesus, all that Jesus has done so that we might celebrate as the church. Here's the first one. God has changed our condition. This is that first thing that they would, they would discover about themselves. God has changed our condition. You say, what? Well, not really sure what that means. Well, it's unpack it. The beginning of a Seder meal, the host will stand up and he'll hold up a piece of unleavened bread, matzah as it's called. And he'll stand up and he'll break it in half. Break it in two. And in doing so, he then goes and he quotes Deuteronomy chapter 16, verse 3, which is also talking about the Feast of Unleavened Bread and how to go about celebrating. <laughs> and what he says is amazing. Let me read this to you. Deuteronomy chapter 16, verse 3. It says, You shall eat no leavened bread with it. Seven days you shall eat it with unleavened bread. And then here he goes. He stands up, he cracks the cracker, and this is what he says. This is the bread of affliction. For you came out of the land of Egypt in haste, that all the days of your life you remember the day when you came out of the land of Egypt. He'd stand up, hold the bread in the air, break it, quoting Deuteronomy, say, this is the bread of affliction. Remind us of when we were in slavery. Now this is what this is. It's a powerful moment. And you look at that, and it's just this wafer, it's a piece of matzo. You say, well, why would we call it the bread of affliction? I mean, I get it, this is a hard moment, but what's going on here? We have to understand that the word that's translated there for affliction is also uh, translated as slavery. This is the bread of slavery. It is the bread of poverty. It is the bread of the afflicted, the poor. And it is for two reasons, a couple of them. 
One is this, the way that, that bread is, is made to rise, the way that you find leavened bread is ultimately that yeast is added to it. Well, in ancient Egypt, they don't have refrigerant, you know, they're, they're not keeping things real cold around there. And so they didn't have storehouses. You couldn't just go to the store and buy yourself some yeast. The way that you made your bread rise was you had to keep yeast alive. It has to be sustained and in a suspended kind of state. It has to have liquid added to it. And then it needs food to consume. Yeast consumes sugars, which is it's a lot of sugar and starters. And bread and activates and eats and multiplies and grows. The way that you would keep it alive is ultimately by making it, by kneading the yeast into your dough, and so it's consuming the dough, it's growing, it's multiplying, and then you would take a piece of that dough and you save it for the next loaf, and you start it all over again, and just keep this thing hungry and moving and have food. If you've ever made bread today with a starter, we're doing the same thing now with that. And so this is what you do. Well, if you're poor, you're not bread. If you're poor, you're not sustaining this practice. You don't have these things, and so... You're not going to have the dough to work with. The other thing about this is this. It was the bread that slaveholders fed slaves. In that culture, in ancient Egypt, it was the bread that the Egyptian slaveholders would feed to the slaves. You see, unleavened bread in ancient Egypt was symbolic of slavery. It was symbolic that when you consumed unleavened bread, it was a subtle way of declaring to you that you are a slave. This is who you are. This is, it, it communicates a kind of life that you cannot escape from. You are stuck. It is the bread of affliction. You know, when I was a young adult, I remember there was an era when I first went through a pretty hard time. My mom had had cancer and was going through it and, and was mad. I was frustrated just because I, I didn't understand why somebody who I perceived to be so loving and so good is just navigating this in such a hard way. I was, I was angry. I was. I was frustrated and hurt. And there were a lot of days at that time that I struggled just to say that God was real. You know, it was everything I could do to believe in Him. I did, but I started to make a ton of choices and different things that I, I now regret. I, I did things that I, I probably never thought I would do. And suddenly I found myself becoming this person that I never wanted to be. And some of you know what that's like. Some of you have made choices and you find yourself like, who was that? Why, why did I even... I never want to be this person you yet here you are. And it was like I dug a hole and I started kind of wrecked with guilt and frustrated and, and hurt and angry and all of this stuff. And, and what I realized, what I felt like was like I had given a part of my life away and I just couldn't get it back. It's like I dug a hole that I couldn't climb out of. In the strangest of ways, I felt like a slave. Like something else was my master. We know what this is like. I believe that every person in some way, shape, or form knows what it is to be a slave to the fears that haunt us. We do. Some of us are terrified deep down that, that you know, we, we long for security. We're a slave to our, our longing, to our need for security. And we're so scared that things aren't going to be okay. And so we spend our whole life trying to make everything okay. And nothing ever really is. Some of us are slaves to our search for meaning. And we're terrified of that empty feeling that when we're quiet, when we're alone, that empty feeling that exists inside of us. And so we spend our entire lives trying to fill it with anything or anyone, just trying to make it better. And yet it's never quite full and never quite adds up. Some of us are slaves who are search for worthiness. And we live our life trying to be better and trying to be seen as, as okay and acceptable and as good. And yet at the end of the day, we're terrified that one day we're going to open our eyes and look around and we're going to be alone. We're struggling. We're scared. And these fears, they exist in us, and they become like this haunting thing that begins to drive our lives. It's like they, they, they take over in such a way through our decisions, through our actions, just we, we sort of hand them the wheel of our lives, so to speak. And the next thing you know, they're driving who we are, they're driving our lives, and suddenly they are our master, and we are the slave, and we struggle. It's, we wonder, how do we get our life back? Because it feels like we gave it away. I remember at that time, I was here in church service, sitting actually in that section over there, three rows in. And the speaker that day was talking on forgiveness and all about how God makes all things new. We took communion, much like we're going to be taking later today. They passed out on the communion. I stood there with a piece of unleavened bread in one hand and a cup in the other. 
And I looked at that breath and I just felt heavy hearted and frustrated and angry. And I'm telling you, it's like it's the, it was the bread of my affliction. Because as I looked at it, it just represented to me that I would never be good enough. It represented to me that some hills you just can't, coals you can't climb out of. That sometimes you give your life away and you just can't get it back. That sometimes you're a slave and that's just how it is. And so Jesus died because you're terrible. That's, that's the way I held this thing and I looked at it. And everything in me was frustrated. And everything in me thought, you know what, I can't change this. And this is just the way things are right now. And I just wanted to get up and walk out of the room. Because who am I even be there? Why am I doing this? Then I heard the speaker quote Jesus when he was in the upper room with his disciples, walking them through the first communion. He said, this is my body broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And it's like suddenly I snapped out of it. Sudden clarity came over me. As I held that bread, I realized this isn't the bread of my affliction. It's his. This isn't the bread that declares me unworthy. This bread isn't about my sin. This bread isn't about the terrible things I've done. This bread isn't about a hole that I am stuck in. This bread isn't about me being a slave. This bread is about his body broken for us. This bread isn't about my affliction. It's about his. And so suddenly when I held that bread in my hand and I raised it to my lips, it was no longer the bread of my affliction. It was no longer that which declared me unworthy. It was the bread of my freedom because it's the bread that is Jesus' body broken for us that we must live. Friends, we don't have to be so afraid. We don't have to live in fear as slaves to our search for meaning. Because God sent Jesus for us that he might live and die and declare you mean this much to me that I would buy your life back. Now live. You want to know what your life is meant for? To live out of all that God created you to be. Communion declares it so. If you're scared, if you're a person who's scared in here because you're worried you're not going to be okay and you're worried about your security, I want you to know, communion, Jesus declares, he'll do anything to be with us. He will go to the ends of the earth and back. He will go to death and back just to have us with him. There is nothing more secure than that. And if you're a person who's struggling and you're so scared about your worth, you are worth the life of Jesus. How much more costly can you be? You are worth everything. Communion, Jesus declares, we have nothing to fear. It is not the bread of our affliction. It's his. It is the bread of our freedom. It's remarkable. It's who we now are. So may it be so. We have all been set free. Just as they celebrated the Feast of the Lord, bread of God who sets the captives free, so also we celebrated in communion. Which brings me to the second thing, the, the last kind of point for the morning, and it's this. We can discover a new perspective. We can discover a new perspective. You say, well, that sounds great. That doesn't seem like that much. No, this is everything. I and mean, this is a really amazing thing. You know, when they would celebrate the Passover uh, feast, and even today if you were to go to a Seder dinner, when you walked in, what you'd, really, what you'd see are people who are sitting down, reclining to eat, and everybody's kind of leaning what would look a little awkwardly to the left. And the reason why is because they were instructed to, when you eat the Seder, when you consume this meal, to do so reclining. You have to ask the question, why? That just seems weird and slightly awkward. They're all kind of leaning at each other. No, it's actually amazing. You see, in ancient Egypt, only freed men and women were allowed to recline on the gate. It's a declaration of freedom. And slaves weren't allowed to do that, and so to sit in that posture and consume that meal declares, I am free. Powerful declaration. And what's amazing, the last thing that they go to eat uh, over the Seder meal is called the afikomen. It's one last piece of matzah, one last piece of unleavened bread, saved at the very end of the meal. And think of how powerful it is to stand in a room, or be present in a room of people that are reflecting on, on a past life of slavery, on the harshness of it, on a God who sets them free, and you look and you see them all reclined, declaring their freedom. As they go now to eat what was called the bread of affliction in the very beginning. But it's not their affliction. It no longer defines them as slaves, for they are free. Powerful moment, isn't it? It's what we should all feel and declare and experience when we take 
community together. We participate in this feast of unleavened bread for us. Things don't have to define you the way you did anymore. The world around you has not changed, but you have, which means when you walk out, everything is different because you see it through the eyes of free men and women. And that changes everything. It makes the bread of affliction so when you come, bread of freedom. Not because of the hardness of the bread, not because slaves no longer eat it, not because of any of that, simply because you as a free person declare it so. You're free. You don't have to be determined and, and driven by the expectations of others, of what you should be. You don't have the freedom to live out of all that God created you to be. You don't have to, to be driven and by, by the, the choices you've made and the sin that's been in your life. You have been set free. Go now, therefore, and live. You don't have to, to endure life. You can live it. You are free. May that change your perspective because of changing your condition and a change in your perspective will change your very life. As I said earlier, there's a moment where Jesus takes the disciples to an upper room in a man's home and they gather together during the feast of unleavened bread. And they go to celebrate by eating a, a Seder dinner, a Passover meal. And it was there that Jesus took that off of home and that bread at the very end and he reinterpreted it. Instead of being the bread of their affliction, his own. It was there that he took the cup and reinterpreted it and said that it was his blood poured out for us. And so this morning we, like they did, are going to celebrate with communion as well. And here's the thing. In just a moment, I'm going to invite you to get up and to, to grab uh, you know, grab the elements, grab the, the cup and the unleavened bread and I want you to make your way back to your seat with it. But before you do, I want to say this. Don't let this be a moment about guilt. Don't let this be a moment about how bad you have been, about things that you have done, about a hole that you can't climb out of. Don't let this moment be driven by you from the perspective of a slave. Because friends, communion is all about you are free. Let this moment be about Jesus and his body broken for you as a declaration of your freedom. If you rise to grab the elements, I will walk us through it as a group in just a moment as you return back to your seats.
going to read through Luke in chapter 22. And as I walk us through this, may you hear this with new ears. May you hear this with all the significance, all the symbolism that we've walked through this morning. May you hear this as free and in verse 14. And when the hour came, he, Jesus, listen to this, reclined at the table and the apostles with him. And he said to them, I have earnestly desired to eat this Passover with you before I suffer. For I will not eat it until it, I will eat, I will not eat it until it is fulfilled in the kingdom of God. And he took a cup, and when he had given thanks, he said, Take this and divide it among yourselves. For I tell you that from now on I will not drink of the fruit of the vine until the kingdom of God comes. And he took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and gave it to them, saying, this is my body, which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Let me take it. Verse 20. And likewise, the cup after the eating said, This cup that is poured out for you is a new covenant in my blood. Take. Friends, communion declares by the blood of Jesus and the power of all that was Jesus and is Jesus and will be Jesus that you are free. So may you find yourself reclining in spirit in, in this place right now. May you find yourself unencumbered. May you walk out in the world this day with open eyes and open hearts because your perspective is not one of someone enslaved and not someone of someone that is trapped in their brokenness, but by somebody set free who sees even their brokenness through the lens and the eyes of freedom, who makes the bread of affliction the bread of freedom simply because you are, because Jesus died for us and rose again. This is our story as the church. This is what we gather to remember. This is what unites us all in this very place to declare that we have been set free, that Jesus is all there is, that he redeems us, that he restores us, that he makes us new, that there is no affliction, there is freedom, that we now live. This is what we come today to celebrate because we have discovered that we are free men and women. And so as we close this service right now, the worship team is going to lead us in song that is all about freedom. And so I want to ask that you stand with one another out of all the communion is, out of all that Jesus has done, out of our stories intertwined, united as one church, will you join your voices and sing a song of freedom together and celebrate?